Luke chapter 6. I'll read to verse 5. We'll look at that passage, and then we'll move on into uh, verse 6 and conclude at verse 11. I need to tell you that normally when I'm doing studies in the Gospels, I have a tendency of taking the entire time in the first portion. For example, I would take 40 minutes, 45 minutes just to speak to you about verses 1 through 5. And so for me, it's a little difficult to try and do these two and compress these two studies, but that's what we're doing. I'm trying to get through Luke, you know, before Jesus returns. Um, we'll see. If I, I kind of hope I, I don't, you know. As a matter of fact, I really hope I don't, and I know you do too, uh, that the Lord might return would be just a wonderful thing. But until that point, let's look at this passage together. Beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 5, Luke chapter 6. Now, what happened on the second Sabbath after the first that he went through the grain fields. And his disciples plucked the heads of grain and ate them, rubbing them in their hands. And some of the Pharisees said to them, Why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? But Jesus answering them said, Shut up. No, he didn't. <laughs> Sometimes you wish you would, though, don't you? <laughs> Jesus answering them said, Have you not even read this, what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he went into the house of God, took and ate the showbread, and also gave some to those who were with him, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. And he said to them, The Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. So as we look at chapter 6, it opens with two controversies. Both of these controversies relate to uh, the Sabbath observation. Verses 1 through 5 concerns itself with physical labor being performed on the Sabbath, and then as we'll see in a moment, verses 6 through 11 are, are, are concerned with the fact that Jesus heals on the Sabbath. Now, we know that the, at this point, Jesus has already begun alienating the religious leaders of his day. and They've already begun making accusations against him. We've seen that already in chapter 5. For example, in chapter 5, verse 21, we've seen that they've already accused him of blasphemy. And in chapter 5, verse 30, they've also already accused him of living an unholy life. And so he's already alienating the religious leaders of his day. And so what is happening now as we enter into chapter 6 is they, they are beginning to search for scriptural reasons to reject Jesus Christ. He's already addressing and has addressed the attitude that they possess. They're already, uh, he spoke about that in chapter 5, verse 39 when he had said, uh, no one having drunk old wine immediately desires new, for he says the old is better. When it says the old is better, that word better simply means it tastes better. It's more agreeable to our palates. In other words, the Pharisees had no desire for what he has to offer them. They are rejecting him because their desires, their hungers, are for something other than what he is offering them. Their tastes are different. They don't want what he wants to give to them. And so they're rejecting him. The Apostle John speaks concerning that kind of attitude in, in John chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, when John says that Jesus was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world didn't recognize him, and he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. And so they are beginning to reject him now. They're beginning to make accusations concerning him, and uh, they are, at this point, beginning to oppose him. Now, one of the primary reasons for their opposition related to the observation of what is called the Sabbath. You see, Sabbath observation is at the heart of the Jewish legalistic religious system. It is the traditional day of rest that is observed by the nation of Israel. See, the Bible speaks concerning the word Sabbath. We all know that word Sabbath. Um, in the Greek, it's sabbaton. In Hebrew, it's Shabbat. When you go to Israel today, they have uh, greetings on Shabbat, Shabbat Shalom. They'll speak to you in that way because the Sabbath is, is, uh, is still recognized as being a day of inactivity. The word Sabbath literally means to cease work or to rest. It, it, you first see that, that mentality, that rest, all the way in the first book of the Bible, in the book of Genesis, in chapter 2 at verse 3, where it says that God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because he rested from all his work which God had created and made. And so in honor of that day, the Lord declared it to be a time of rest as well as remembrance. The Jewish nation was to rest on the Sabbath and to remember him on that day. And so God gave them this Sabbath rest in the law. You see that if you take notes in Exodus in chapter 20, verses 9 through 11. 
where God says, six days shall you labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you nor your son nor your daughter, your manservant nor your maidservant, nor your cattle nor your stranger that is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. The Sabbath day is the day of rest for the nation of Israel. Sometimes I'm asked the question, well, if God gave the nation of Israel the Sabbath, why do we go to church on Sunday? Seeing they observe from Friday sundown into Saturday sundown as Shabbat, why don't we go to church on, uh, on Saturday rather than attending church on Sunday? Why is that? And the quick answer is because Jesus was raised on the first day of the week, and the church has, from the book of Acts on, been meeting habitually on the first day of the week in celebration of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, secondly, uh, Paul speaking to the book of Ro in the book of Romans to those in the Roman church who had questions concerning holy days and observations like that said, that some people look at one day as more important than the other, and others deal with each day as equally holy. And so we can have services where we observe or we can rest on certain days that are not necessarily the Sabbath day. It can be um, a Sunday. It can be a Wednesday. It can be any day of the week. And so that's a, another reason. A third reason is because the Sabbath was for the nation of Israel and is not necessarily for the church. Uh, according to Exodus chapter 31, verse 13, the Lord God says, Speak also to the children of Israel saying, Surely my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. And so the Sabbath keeping is for the nation of Israel and not necessarily for the church. Now, over the centuries, the Jewish religious leaders observed Sabbath. Unfortunately, they began to add rules and regulations to it. And so any kind of work imaginable was strictly forbidden I was reading concerning some of the things that were forbidden, and you'll find it interesting. For example, tailors did not carry a needle for fear that they might be tempted to sew. Clothing could not be washed or dyed. Fires could not be lit or extinguished. Baths could not be taken for fear water would fall on the floor and wash it. You could not carry anything heavier than a dried fig. Chairs could not be moved because dragging them might make a furrow in the ground. Women did not look into mirrors in the event that they might see a gray hair and pluck it out. False teeth could not be worn because they exceeded the weight limit you were allowed to carry. <laughs> and so there were quite a number of rules and regulations that related to the Sabbath's observation. And so the Sabbath during the time of Jesus became a time of frustration as well as stress because the people began to be tired of bearing an ungodly yoke of man-made oppressive regulations. And so the Sabbath is a very important element in the religious observation of the Jews during the time of Christ. And so Jesus is going to be having some controversies related to the observation of Sabbath. And that's what we see here. Notice verse 1 again here in chapter 6 of Luke. It says, It happened on the second Sabbath after the first that he went through the grain fields. His disciples plucked the heads of grain and ate them, rubbing them in their hands. So he's walking through grain fields, as Luke says, and his disciples are so hungry that they begin to just reach up to the grain and they're beginning to pluck it. Now, somebody might be saying, now aren't they stealing? They're going through somebody else's field or buy a field and they're taking the food from it. Isn't that wrong? Well, no, it isn't, because under the law of Moses, that was permissible. In Deuteronomy, in chapter 23, 25, uh, God had said, when you come into the standing corn of your neighbor, you may pluck the ears with your hand. In Leviticus, chapter 19, verse 10, you shall not glean your vineyard, neither shall you gather every grape of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and stranger. I am the Lord your God. It was permissible for them to do that. They were hungry. They were passing through. And so it was permissible for them to be able to reach up and to take that fruit. It's similar today. I mean, in my, it, it, in my we'll say my backyard, I might have a neighbor who has a, an orange tree and his orange tree is, is uh, the branches are spreading out and, 
And so the branches are over my property line, and I can go there and I can eat his oranges and enjoy them as I, I do uh, and not feel guilty. Actually, I'm just teasing. But, uh, but that can take place, and it's all right, and so there's nothing wrong with that. So as this is taking place, though, I want you to see that the Pharisees respond. Verse 2, it says, Some of the Pharisees said to them, Why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? Now, what are you saying? Well, I want you to notice in verse 1 how it says, They plucked the heads of grain and they rubbed them in their hands. To the, to the uh, Pharisees, what they were actually doing was reaping when they, when they plucked it and threshing when they rubbed it in their hands. So they were actually guilty of breaking two laws, at least in the way they thought. You see, the law doesn't say that. This was really their own religious tradition. And in their own mind, their religious tradition was equal to the Word of God. And so what they're saying is you have broken rabbinic law. It is not lawful for you to do that on the Sabbath. Now, in verse 3, you have Jesus there answering them, and he says, Have you not even read this, what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he went into the house of God, took and ate the showbread, and also gave some to those who were with him, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. So what he does, and you might not notice this at first reading, is he actually gives to them a cutting statement. What he is doing is offending their pride because in the way that he asks them, and notice how it says it in verse 3, have you not even read this? He's speaking to the legal experts in the, in the religious law of the nation of Israel. And in saying that to them, he's actually cutting into their pride because these of all people should have known and understood, and indeed they have read what the Word of God would have to say about that. And so what he's doing is he's, he's offending their prideful belief that they are experts. I want you to see something else, though, here. Because I think this is the way that you deal with those kinds of controversies and questions. I want you to see how he responds to this. Notice that he doesn't argue with them about religious tradition. Notice that with me. He didn't start an argument with them about religious tradition. He simply quoted Scripture. He asked them concerning what the Word of God has to say. That is a very, very important thing to learn to do, guys. To be able to point to Scripture... Let's see if I can bring this home in a way that's non-offensive. No, so I'll just say it this way. <laughs> Somebody asked me once, why don't you honor Mary, the mother of God? And this was a Catholic speaking, and this is how they phrased the question, Mary, the mother of God. Why do you as a, a Protestant not give honor to, uh, to Mary? My response of course we give honor to Mary. Mary is the mother of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And obviously we give honor to her. So I said, um, you know in the Gospel of John, in chapter 2, where Jesus is there and uh, his mother, he's at the wedding feast of Cana of Galilee, and his mother uh, walks up after discovering that uh, there is no wine, that they've run out of uh, the wine and all, how, how, how um, Mary says to Jesus they have no wine. You remember that story? And I know all of us in this room do. And uh, yes. Do um, you remember how when Jesus spoke to his mom and shared a few things, do you remember how she said to the men, Whatever he says, do it. And that's John chapter 2. Whatever he says, do it. Yes, I do honor the mother of Jesus Christ because she said, whatever he says, do it. Now, let's ask the question, what does he say? And what he says is, unless a man is born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That's what he says. What he says is, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. That's what he said. And so when I'm listening to what Jesus said, I am honoring his mother because it is his mother who said, whatever he says to you, you do. See, there's no need to argue religious tradition. All you need to do is open up what the Scripture says. What does the Scripture say? And then follow that. And so Jesus doesn't begin to argue with them about their 
the variety of things that they've added to the law. What he does is he simply quotes Scripture. Now, the Bible tells us in 2 Timothy, in chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So, God's Word is all that is necessary for us to handle these kinds of controversies. So, what does he do? Well, he asks the question again in verse 3, have you not even read this, what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him. So, he refers to what we would, we would call today 1 Samuel chapter 21, a story that is found there with King David. And, and that's the story about David when he fled to a, a priestly city called Nob. That's where the tabernacle was at that time, tabernacle being the tent of meeting where God would meet with the nation of Israel. And so, he went to the city of Nob where the tabernacle was at that time, and, and he and his men had no food. Now, as they had no food, they actually were given the showbread. And that's what Jesus refers to in verse 4, how we went into the house of God, took and ate the showbread. The word showbread there speaks of 12 loaves of bread that are called the bread of the presence. The bread of the presence represents the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel which are before the Lord both night and day. But the bread was to be eaten not by common but by the priests. And yet David, who was not a priest, went and he and his men ate of that bread. You see, according to Exodus 29 verse 32, the Bible says, at the entrance to the tent of meeting, Aaron and his sons are to eat the meat of the ram and the bread that is in the basket. They are to eat these offerings by which atonement was made for their ordination and consecration. No one else may eat them because they are sacred. And yet, God allowed this law to be violated so that David and his men might be fed. And so, the point he's making is human need is more important than man-made regulations. And so, if a man-made regulation is broken, it is not as important as when you care for a human being. And that's the point he's making. And so, he closes with verse 5 by saying, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. In other words, I have authority to change your way of viewing the Sabbath because what I am doing is I am ridding my people of the terrible burden of your religious traditionalism, a traditionalism that, that, that is devoid of the Spirit of God and is filled with man-made regulations and rules that do not bring people to God, but simply weigh them down. If you take notes, Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, powerful scripture that goes along with this, because Jesus in that passage said it this way. He said, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. See, so when you have a relationship with the Lord, He doesn't add a burden to you. He doesn't add what is called the yoke of the law to you. He gives you His grace because His yoke is easy. His burden is light. And so if I am laboring in my walk with the Lord, perhaps I'm not wearing His yoke. Perhaps at this point what I'm doing is trying to do it on my own. When a, uh, when a farmer would be breaking in uh, an ox, a young ox, he would put that ox next to an older one and they would put a custom fit yoke over their shoulder area. And it was the older ox that basically did all the work while the younger one began to learn to walk alongside of him as the work was being done. Jesus is saying, I have a custom-made yoke that will be fitting right over you so that as I walk in this perfect way, you will match me step by step and I'll bring you into the peace that religious traditionalism never will bring to you. And people, um, people today try to have peace with the religion but what we need is peace with our God, and our peace with our God comes through faith in Him. And so the Lord Jesus Christ makes it very easy for us to understand. My yoke is easy, He says, my burden is light. Moving on into verse 6, it happened on another Sabbath also that He entered the synagogue and taught. And a man was there whose right hand was withered, and 
the scribes and Pharisees watched him closely whether he would heal on the Sabbath that they might find an accusation against him. But he knew their thoughts and said to the man who had the withered hand, Arise and stand here. And he arose and stood. Then Jesus said to them, I'll ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to, to do good or to do evil, to save a life or to destroy it? And looking around at them all, he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he did so. And his hand was restored as whole as the other. But they were filled with rage and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. Now, once again, he's teaching. Once again, this is a Sabbath. He's in a synagogue. Present in the synagogue is a man who is afflicted with a withered right hand. Again, his um, opponents are going to have an opportunity to accuse him. And notice, this is interesting to me how it says in verse 7, notice how the scribes and the Pharisees watch him closely whether he's going to heal on the Sabbath. This is interesting because they're watching him, hoping to catch him do something good. You know, I've had people catch me do something bad plenty of times, but you've got to ask the question, how many times have you been actually caught doing something good? And that's what they're doing. They're watching him closely that they might find an accusation against him. Now, the word watched there is a word that speaks of watching with evil intent close scrutiny. They're looking with the intent of finding fault with him. They are not observing him as somebody who admires him. They're not observing him as those who cannot keep their eyes off of somebody that they love. You know, we understand that. I mean, if you've got a girlfriend, boyfriend, husband, wife, children, grandchild, whatever, and you see them, and sometimes you just can't take your eyes off of them, you know, for me, that's the way it is with my family. That's the way it is right now with my grandson, Josiah. And the minute I see him, you know, I just have my eyes on him. I can't take my eyes off him because I love him so much, you know. There are times that you look at that person and you just can't keep your eyes off of them because you love him, you admire him, or whatever it is. That's not how they're looking at Jesus. What they're doing is they're sitting back watching him because they're going to find him doing something that they can accuse him of. But the thing that they're looking for him to do is something good. They're looking to see if he's going to do something that they can find uh, fault with. And so, um, he is under a microscope. Now, by way of application, believers, even today in the 21st century, are often under the same kind of microscope. People will watch your life because as they do so, they have the gospel lived out in, in, in uh, living color, if you will. Your life, my life is observed by people. There's no doubt about it, and it's not because we're kind of paranoid and this and that, and we, we've got this, this fear that, that we're being watched all the time. No, the reality of the fact is, is when you say, I follow the Lord, there's no doubt about it, people do keep an eye on you because you've made that statement that you follow God. And so, it makes a testimony of a pure faith, a faith-filled life uh, very powerful because people will watch you. Now, the Bible tells us, if you take notes, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, the Bible tells us that we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God intends, in other words, for those of us who are believers to walk in good works. And uh, we are living letters uh, known and read by all men. Uh, Paul said it this way, you yourselves are our letter written on our hearts known and read by everybody. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. During the uh, time of the writing of 2 Corinthians, that was 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 2 and 3, during the time of the writing of that letter, there were, there were uh, letters of recommendation that would be written. Say that you were in this fellowship, and uh, you went from this fellowship to another state, and uh, you have ministry, and you desire to serve the Lord at a Calvary ministry in New York. And so, you come up to me and you say, Pastor Dave, I'm going to be going to, uh, you know, upstate New York. And uh, I understand that there's a Calvary chapel up there, and I say, there are, there are several Calvary chapels up in the upstate New York area. Well, I'm going to be going to uh, Calvary Chapel Finger Lakes. And I said, well, that's great. I know, I know the pastor there. I've known 
pastor's father for many years. We're on the radio out there in Finger Lakes. That's great. Um, well, you know, I'm going to be doing some ministry, and I want to, I want to uh, you know, I want to share while I'm there because I'm going to be there for uh, a little while. Uh, can you write me a letter of recommendation? And so I say, um, no. No, I say, sure, how much you want to give me? Um, so I say, of course. And I write and I say, this is a so-and-so, been in our fellowship for this long here, great person, loves the Lord, tremendous ministry, highly recommend them. And uh, while they're with you, should you have opportunity to use them, encourage you to do so. They're a blessing to all of us. That's a letter of recommendation. That's what Paul's talking about. You see, because people would sometimes come into churches just like this 2,000 years ago, and they would claim to have some kind of authority. They would say, I have a message from the Lord. And so the question would be asked, what fellowship do you come from? Oh, I come from the church of Ephesus. Who's the pastor there? You know, I find it interesting. I have people on occasion approach me and speak to me, and they say, well, I just came here from such and so church. And I say, really, how long were you there? Oh, I was there for three years. Really? What's the pastor's name? They don't know. They say, oh, really? You don't know? Well, you know, I wasn't there that long. How long were you there? Two years. Really? How interesting is that? Some people don't even know the pastor's name because they really don't go there. A lot of people claim to have a church that's theirs, but they don't even really go there. 30% of the church is gone every Sunday. Every Sunday that we have church services, at least 30% aren't even here. I have run across people that I haven't seen in church in two or three years, and they'll say, oh, hi, pastor, how you doing, you know? And I say, fine, how are you doing? Where you go to church? Oh, I still go with you. I, I haven't seen you. Yeah, well, I still go there. <laughs> yeah, right, in your dreams, you know? <laughs> you go to St. Mattress, um, <laughs> the Church of the Living Springs. <laughs> so there are letters of recommendation, and so... They'll say, where do you come from? We come from Ephesus. Oh, really, who's the pastor? Well, John is pastor in the church. Oh, that's great. Uh, do you have your letter of recommendation? Oh, yes. They'll open it up, and it's a commendation to them. Well, that's what you are. Do you know that? Do you know that? When Paul was writing here in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 2 and 3, he was saying in its context that the, uh, there are people who are demanding, this is the context of this, there are people who are demanding that I have a letter of reference to point out that I really have authority in the body of Christ. He says, I don't need a letter of recommendation. The reason I don't is because you are my letter of recommendation. Because your walk with God demonstrates whether or not I'm called by God to equip the saints for works of service. So do you guys who call this church your home, do you realize that you are the letter of recommendation for Calvary Chapel Chino Valley? Do you realize that? that when you leave this place and go out into the job site or go wherever it is that you go to school, your neighborhood or whatever, do you realize that? Do you realize that you are the letter that your neighbors and your fellow workers and your fellow students, your unbelieving friends and relatives, you are the letter that they're reading? It's very important for us to understand that because it causes us to be on our toes because we are bringing either either shame to the name of Christ or glory to it by the way that we live. And so people do watch you, and they watch you very, very carefully. Because that's true, Christians need to conscientiously guard their walks so that we might appropriately model the grace of God that's lived out in, in a person's life. That's why 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12 is so important. Because Paul, when he's writing to a young man by the name of Timothy, says to him, let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, with all purity. I was 23 years old once, and I was teaching Bible studies at the age of 23. My first congregation consisted of my family and some neighbors. My dad was 47. My mom was 43. And I am 23 years old, and I've been out of the military for several months. And a relatively new Christian of probably less than three years or so in my walk with the Lord at that time. What gave me, at the age of 23, the ability to communicate the things of God to a man who was almost 50 years old. 
It certainly wasn't eloquence, and it most certainly wasn't intelligence. It, it was not a lot of experience with God because I was a new believer. What was it? You know, part of what it was with my dad is my dad saw a transformation. He saw a kid who was in rebellion and had been so for years, transformed miraculously by the power of the Spirit of God and a love for God's Word. And my dad, who was 47 years old, respected me at the age of 23 as his Bible teacher, and my dad respected me to the day I buried him as his pastor. And I never forgot Paul's words to Timothy, let no one despise your youth, but be thou an example of the believer, because that's what it's all about. You see, there's more to life than doing what pleases me and trying to be authentic to the point where my carnality is excused because it's real, and I'm being real in front of people. No. God hasn't told me, live a carnal life and call it authentic. God has said, live for Jesus Christ and demonstrate that it's possible to live a successful life and to have a life that's blessed by God. And that's what he was speaking to this young man, Timothy, because Timothy is a young man in a society much like ours that respects the older people, not the younger ones. And therefore, Paul says, you need to have an example. He says, be an example in a word. When he speaks of being an example of word, that's, that's, that's your speech because out of the abundance of the heart, uh, the mouth speaks. And so you're to live as an example of, of word. He says, in conduct, uh, that means you are recognizably growing in Christ-likeness. It speaks of your manner of life. Uh, he speaks of, of love. That's the agape love of God. May that be so evident in you that they know that God has done something in your life. He speaks about their spirit. That speaks of your mental attitude. You're a charitable and loving and caring individual. He speaks about faith because it speaks of your faith in Christ as well as the way that you live. And he speaks about your purity because that speaks of your moral excellence or your sexual purity. He says this is what you ought to be living like in order that people will see the power of God to transform lives. So Jesus is here. And it's a Sabbath. There are people gathered around, but they intend to find, as it says in verse 7, an accusation against him. Now, they expect him to heal. They know he's going to do something. They expect him to heal or do something like that. And yet, even though they're aware of the fact that he has the power to do that, they still are bent on rejecting him. And so what they want to do is they want to convict him of breaking the law of Moses in order that they might discredit him. You see, to accuse Jesus was to find him in violation of breaking the law of the Sabbath, and that would constitute a charge they could bring against him against the Jewish religious, before the Jewish religious court because uh, under some conditions, working on the Sabbath is actually a capital offense. It's something that is punishable by death. Exodus 31, 14 says, Observe the Sabbath, it's holy to you. Anyone who desecrates it must be put to death. Whoever does any work on that day must be cut off from his people. So Jesus is being watched, and he knows it. What does he do? Does he hide? Does he say, uh-oh, they're, they're keeping an eye on me? Notice what he does. It says in verse 8, he knew their thoughts. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, Arise and stand here. And he arose and stood. So he takes the offensive. He's going to do something in plain view of everybody. And that's his habit. He tells the man, arise and stand. You see, later on in John chapter 18, verses 19 and 20, the Bible says the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and teaching, and this was Jesus' response. He said, I have spoken openly to the world. I always taught in the synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews come together. I said nothing in secret. So Jesus did things openly. He wasn't hiding it. I don't know if I mentioned this to you recently. Uh, one of our ministers was invited to go and do an outreach at a particular church. They asked, would you come and share? And uh, he was asking me, Is, you know, what do you think? Should I go? And I said, what do they want you to do? He says, well, they're going to have some music and they're going to have a few things. But they said um, that I could share, but I have to be careful not to bring too much conviction because they don't want us to make the people uncomfortable there because, uh, because they want us to evangelize but not bring conviction. 
And I said, that's an interesting way to think. How long do you have to speak? About 15 minutes. So they're going to have a band, and they're going to have refreshments, and they're going to have a pep talk for 15 minutes, and they call it evangelism. And that's kind of the state of the church today, unfortunately, guys. Unwilling to say the hard thing for fear of offending sensitive hearers. Jesus was not afraid of telling the truth, and neither should we be. And he did it openly. He asked the question, basically, is it lawful on the Sabbath to, to do good or to do evil, to save a life or to destroy it? Now, doing good is actually the life of the believer. That's what we're supposed to do. Psalm 37, 3, trust in the Lord and do good. Ecclesiastes 3.12, there's nothing better for men than to be happy and do good while they live. James 4.17, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. It is the life of the believer to be known for those who do good. And so he asks the question that actually begs the answer. The answer, obviously, is it's always right to do good. And so in verse 10, looking around at them, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. <laughs> he did so. His hand was restored as whole as the other. They were filled with rage and disgust with one another what they might do to Jesus. Now, in Mark chapter 3, verse 5, Mark says, He looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts. When it says he was grieved, that word grieved means an anguish. It, it's a heart that is filled with pain. When he speaks of the hardness, that speaks of a callousness. He's angered at their fault-finding. He's angry at their evil thoughts and their obstinate refusal to answer. And, and it's their hardness to people's pain that causes Jesus to get angry. They would rather this man remain crippled than to break their traditions regarding the Sabbath. Their regulations and their rules were more important to them than somebody's eternity. Years ago, I was an assistant pastor in another Calvary chapel, and we wanted to do a series of outreaches, and at that time, we were renting a church. We didn't own it. And um, so we spoke to the, uh, the elders of the church, their committee, and we said, we want to do some outreaches to reach this community, and we want to rent the, uh, the church facilities on a Saturday night so we can have a series of concerts, so we can reach the kids in the community. And we were going to be bringing in some bands and all. And the first thing they asked us is, what kind of musical instruments do they play in these bands? And we said, well, just normal instruments. You know, they have drums and guitars and, you know, things like that. No, you can't. You can't use electric guitars in the sanctuary. But you can use it in the fellowship hall. So we said, we can't rent the church sanctuary. Why? Because you're going to have electric guitars. And it was like, but we can have it in the fellowship hall? Yeah, you can have it in the fellowship hall. And we're Calvary guys. So we walk out of that meeting going, I guess God doesn't like to go to the fellowship hall and he only hangs around in the sanctuary. It made absolutely no sense to us. Does it make sense to you? It didn't make any sense to me at all. It's like the Lord says, no, here, you have to have pipe organs in here, you know, but out there you can rock. It doesn't make any sense. You know, it didn't make sense then. It doesn't make sense now. And the thing that was sad is that these people didn't realize that what we wanted to do is reach people for the kingdom of God to transform their lives to the gospel of Jesus Christ. But their tradition, but their sense that you can't have that kind of music in this facility would keep them from reaching the youth, reaching the people who, who will listen to that music and then come on in and, and they'll hear the music. We've been doing this for 25 years here. They'll hear the music. And some of you don't like it. I know I get the letters sometimes, the music. Oh, man, I don't like that. Just turn your hearing aid a little lower. It won't hurt that bad. <laughs> but they get caught up. It's the old wineskin kind of thing, you know? It's the old wineskin thing. And, and these people didn't want us to reach the crippled, those who were lost, because we wanted to use certain instruments 
that they had a problem with drums and electric guitars. And that was, that was 20 some years ago, 26 years ago, 27 years ago. And it hasn't really changed even to this day. And how does Jesus respond to that? With anger. They would prefer people to remain crippled as long as it doesn't break their traditions. And that to me is still a sad fact, continues to be this way. But notice what Jesus does. He speaks to this man and he says, stretch out your hand. <laughs> no, wait a minute. How can he? It's crippled. It's withered. It's paralyzed. It's immobile. The guy could have been reasoning within himself and he could have said to the Lord, listen, my hand is withered. How can I stretch it out? Make it whole first, and, and afterwards I will do as you say. Isn't it interesting that the Lord Jesus Christ gave to him an impossible, and you've got to see this, an impossible command and then the power to fulfill it. He gave him an impossible command. Stretch out your hand. He can't because it's withered. It's paralyzed. There's no way he can do that. But he says, stretch it out. He gives the command and as the guy obeys, he gives him the power to fulfill. You know, the Bible in Luke 137 says, with God, nothing will be impossible. When the Lord gives a command, the Lord gives the power to fulfill it. It would appear reasonable if he thinks, I can't do it, heal it first and then I'll stretch it out. That appears reasonable. It's even logical. But in his case, it would have been foolish. So when God says, move, it's wise for us to do so. Faith disregards apparent impossibilities where there's a command and promise of God. Interestingly enough, the man was healed with a word without even a touch. The Sabbath was unbroken. Even according to the most rigid interpretation of the letter of the law, Jesus, through a word, healed this man. Didn't even reach forth and touch him. But you know what? They didn't see it. What was their response? Did they say, oh, my God, I just saw a miracle. Did you see that? Did you see that? Can you imagine what it would have been like to be there to watch this man? They all knew he had a withered hand and a crippled hand to see it receive strength again. Could you imagine how hardened in your heart you have to be to reject that and to actually get angry? But that's what happens. They were filled with rage and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. Legalism is always the enemy of grace. Always has been, always will be. This man obeyed and was healed. By way of application, what do you think the Lord may be speaking to your heart today as a believer? What has he been telling you that he wants you to do and you've been saying, I really can't do that, Lord, unless you do certain things to make it possible, I can't do that. Well, you know what I've discovered? If the Lord puts it on your heart to do something, it's just of utmost wisdom to do it when he puts it on your heart. I was speaking to a friend of mine just today, and uh, I'll close by illustrating it in this way. He said, I had a Bible track. I was driving. And he said, and I was praying fervently, Lord, I want to give this track to somebody. I want to give this track to somebody. And just, Lord... Just show me who you want me to give this Bible tract to. I want to share your love with somebody today. I'm going to this gas station. And uh, Lord, I know you have somebody in this gas station that you want me to give this tract to. So he says he pulls over and he begins to, uh, you know, he's there at the gas station and he's just looking around to see who the Lord is going to bring for him to give this tract to. Well, this guy comes walking out and he says, and I'm going to be honest with you, Pastor. He says, he was a gangbanger. He says, and as he walked out, he had tattoos all over his head and everywhere, and he looked really rough. And he said, and I just thought, no, that can't be the one I'm supposed to give this track to. He says, no, you know, send me a 95-year-old harmless old woman, you know, but I'm a little nervous with you know, this rough-looking guy. So he's looking around, and he says, nobody else walks out, so this has got to be the guy. So he, he says, so I'm standing there, and this, this guy's walking by, and he says, so I call the guy, hey, come here. And the guy looks at him like, what? And he says, come here. And the guy walks over and he says, I want to give you something. And he says, the guy says, yeah, what do you want to give me? He says this, and he hands him a track. As he hands him the track and starts to talk to him about the love of Christ, 
And this guy's a rough-looking guy. The guy says, you know, talks to him a little bit, and he says, where do you live? And the guy says, well, I live over here in Diamond Bar. He says, well, have you ever heard of Raul Ruiz? And the guy says, no, I don't think I have. He says, oh, he's got a church right here. You know, he tells him where Raul's fellowship is and all. And the guy says, well, wait a minute, come with me. So my friend walks with this guy to the car, this guy's car, and his wife is there in the car. And he says, he says give me that picture. So th his wife gives him a picture, and it's a picture of him and several of his, his, his guys. And they're all kneeling down, and directly behind them is a picture of Raul's church building. He goes, is this the church you're talking about? And my friend says, yeah, that's, that's Calvary Chapel, Golden Springs. He says, we were there last week. Yeah, I've never been there before. I don't go to that church. I've never been there before, but one of my friends was, was killed, and we went to the funeral there. And so my friend says, well, that's the church I'm telling you about, and continued sharing with him. And so he finally looks at the guy and says, do you want to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior? And the man goes, yes, I do. And the wife says, now you wait a minute. I want to receive Jesus too. And my friend says, they kneel down next to the car. They kneel down next to the car in a gas station, and they gave their hearts to Jesus Christ. What does God want to do with you? What does he want to do with you? He can do, yeah, clap, go ahead, let it go. Come on. Okay. Okay. You're going to clap, clap. Okay. Like you're at an opera. Oh, that was nice. <laughs> no, that's, that's what God wants to do. All you have to do is to say, here am I. I'm willing to do it openly. I'm willing to do it for you. God, nothing's impossible with you. Let's see what you want to do. You'll be surprised what God can do through a willing vessel. Just be open. And don't get caught up with legalism. Let God's Holy Spirit work freely through you. Don't get angry, you know, when you see people are doing things differently. Just let God take care of that. Let you walk in the grace of God and watch what the Lord will do for you.